sort of forgotten to record the meeting, but now I have. In the future, please remind me to, to record the meetings. Okay, so let's continue. Now, traditionally, we have always arranged our flip-flops, like for instance, when we were doing um, uh, uh, shifting, uh, data shifting uh, or shift registers, we were arranging our flip-flops from left to right, okay? And we can still do that, meaning that you have maybe uh, C, uh, B, A, and the data is going out there. What we really want, Okay, I've unmuted a few people. What we really want is to make sure, remember that when we are counting, we need to consider that um, uh, the most significant bit is on one side and the least significant bit is on one side. Now, usually the least significant bit is to the right and the most significant bit to the left, which is why we now arrange our flip-flops from right to left. So this A is the least significant bit and this D is the most significant bit. Anyway, to have a JK flip-flop, you get your least significant bit flip-flop. You make sure that J is equal to K is equal to one. The reason why we do that is that we want them to toggle. Okay. Now, the output of A of the first flip-flop or the least significant bit flip-flop uh, acts as the clock of the next flip-flop. Uh, the output of that flip-flop acts as the, um, you know, this is the clock. The output here acts as the clock of the next one and the output of that acts as the clock of the next one. And if we had another flip-flop here, then the uh, output of, of D would act as the clock of the next one and so on and so forth. When you arrange your flip-flops in this way, you have created a counter and that counter is called an asynchronous counter or so-called a RIPO counter, we are going to see why. If you didn't want, so for instance, in this other arrangement, this other diagram down here, this is now our A and that uh, is our B. Uh, so you could say Q1 uh, and Q0. You can see that now the arrangement is different from that one. But if you look clearly, you will notice that this is high, okay? This is should always be high. And this output drives the clock of the next flip-flop and J is equal to K is also um, equal to one. So all of these, I think I have it here. Um, I should have said for all uh, flip-flops, J is equal to, yeah, to K is equal to one. Because you remember we are up here. If you look at the truth table, we are interested in this, we want the clock, these flip-flops to toggle. As long as we have J is equal to K is equal to one, when we get the clock, the right clock, we want to have that uh, toggle action. So that if it was a one, it changes to a zero. If it was a zero, it changes to one. Let us look at um, uh, this one. This is a three-bit flip-flop, okay? Uh, a three-bit RIPO counter. Let's see if we can uh, try to work out. So we can see da, 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 that one, uh, that one, and so on. So just to draw this so that it can be a bit clear to everyone, and so on and so forth. I'm going to get One. So let us first of all consider A. At A, if I consider A, I want to use a black uh, pen. If I consider A, I remember I read that J is equal to K is equal to one. And so every time I get the right clock, 
I should toggle. If it was a one, it becomes a zero. If it was a zero, it becomes a one. Now, let me assume that uh, CBA was previously zero, zero, zero. I mean, in other words, everything was zero. That means my A was zero until the NGT. NGT, you have a bubble there. So when you have a bubble at the clock, that is a negative going transition. And so we wait for the right clock where the clock moves from positive uh, to negative. Now, because the A is a one, it should toggle to a zero. To, sorry, it's a, it's a zero, it should toggle to a one and stay at one until the next clock transition. And because it is the J and the K are still one, one, it should toggle again back to zero. And it will stay at zero until the next clock and where it toggles to one until the next clock to zero. So you have this kind of uh, action. Uh, and so on and so forth, right? So that is clear. Now we know that J, now we are no longer worried about the clock because we know that A now drives the clock of that one. Yet J and K is equal to one for B as well. So for B, we are going to be looking at the output of A to C when the right clock transition happens. And clearly, it will happen when it is moving from the positive to the negative or from one to zero, which is the NGT. And so we are looking for uh, these kind of points. Now, B is initially zero as well. So it will stay at zero until A changes from a one to a zero in which case it should toggle to one and it will stay at one until the next NGT toggles to zero until the next NGT toggles to one and so on, just like uh, the case with output A and so on. Now C follows suit. C is being driven by the output of B. So B is the clock of C. And so for C, we are going to be looking for the NGT, the negative going transition in B, which is the point at which B moves from a one to a zero, which is that point, that point, that point, and so on. So C will move, will stay at zero because it was initially zero. It will stay at zero until, uh, until uh, that point, it will move to one until that point when NGT goes back to zero it will stay at zero and, uh, until that point and so on uh, and so forth. So we have, and so why the reason why we call this a ripe counter is because you can see that these outputs are changing at different times. It's sort of creating a ripe. This one changes, then after some time it forces that one to change and then after some time it also forces that to change. It's uh, almost uh, like a ripe. So if we look at the clock time before the clocks, okay, before the first clock, we were at zero, 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 right? Now, between the first and the second clock, C is still zero, B is zero, but A is now one. Between this, C is still zero, B is a one, clearly, and now A is a zero. Uh, C is still zero here, but now both B and A, a one. Uh, in between four and five, we have C is now a one, but these other two are zero. And if you follow through, you'll get this one zero one, one one zero, and one one one. Now after one one one, between eight and nine, everything goes back to zero, zero zero one, and so on. In other words, at this point, after that state, it goes back to that state. So this is a three bit counter, meaning that it will count through zero, zero, zero to one, 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 which is uh, eight distinct steps. Um, and so it will keep counting in bundles of eight. You could have things, it will count them in bundles of eight. If you have more than eight unique things, then this ripple counter is not going uh, to help you. <laughs> Right. Let us look at this one. You can see that this one is the same. 
A only changes uh, at the right clock transition, which is that NGT. This is now a four bit uh, RIPO counter uh, and so on. Now for B, we are going to see that actually it only responds at the point where A moves from a one to a zero. So for B, the clock is A and it only makes an effect if it moves in an NGT uh, uh, direction, negative going transition, which are these points. Okay. And we can see that at each of these points, B is going to change. Okay, it will toggle, it will move from the state where it was to another one. And then for B, it affects C in the same way. So C should change at these steps or at these points. And as we can see, C will change at those points. And with D, D will be driven by C. So D only toggles when C moves in an NGT uh, direction. And when you do the counting, you can see that we are moving from 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, all the way to 1, 1, 1, 1, after which we go back to 0. It's almost like clearing. And so after this state, we basically return here. And so if you keep applying the right clock pulses, then the counter is going to count from zero to the maximum and go back uh, to where it started. Okay, that's, I think that is probably enough recap. If you have any questions, now is a good time uh, to ask. Now there's something, okay. Uh, I don't know. There's something we call a mod number. You should obviously remember this. Mod number is the number of distinct states through which a counter, you know, goes. The counter state, the counter state through which each counter goes. So, for instance, here we know that we are moving from zero 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 all the way to one 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 one, and so these are sixteen steps. And so we can say that this is a mod. 16 RIPO counter, as simple as that. It's just a mod number. So I can say for design for me a 32, uh, a mod 32 counter. Design for me a mod, you know, mod 87 counter. I mean, oh, how many flip flops are in a 128 mod counter? Now, generally, the mod is generally equal, the mod number is generally equal to 2 per n, where n is the number of flip flops. Meaning that if you have one flip flop, you have a mod 2 uh, counter. Because if you have one flip flop, it is either a 0 or a 1. So those are two distinct states. If you have two flip flops, you create a mod 2 to power 2, which is a mod 4 counter 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. When it reaches 1, 1, it goes back to 0, 0. Um, if you have 2 to power 6, I think that's 64. So this is a, a 6 bit counter whose mod is mod 64. Now, this one can, uh, can count 64 unique things uh, starting from 0, decimal 0, to decimal 63. This is important. In terms of counting, it is basically 2 to power n minus 1. But in terms of mod, it is 2 to power n. In terms of counting, this is the maximum value, which would be in this case uh, 63. Let's also look at something quite small here. Uh, let's say the frequency of, of the clock is equal to, let's say it is equal to 32 has, right? What is the frequency? Frequency is equal to one over, over T. Now, that means that in one second, we change, no, in one second, we can take that to be, can we take to be that to be a second? Uh, probably not. We can say, uh, for instance, okay, maybe I'm, I'm starting this wrongly. Let me just recap on that. Okay, 
what I'm going to do is to right. Okay, so we are back here. Okay, now let's say that one clock pulse is equal to one second. Let's just say that. That means if you notice this, this signal starts from here up to there and repeats. Now it starts to repeat itself. It just starts to repeat itself. Each of these is the same. And so we can say that frequency of the clock, for instance, is one has, okay? Because in each second, it repeats once. Okay, fine. Now, because we know that frequency is equal to one over time, which is the time in which it changes, which is, it changes once in, okay, it repeats once in every one second, which is one has. Let us look at case, uh, the case of A. With A, we start here, the first second ends here, but this is not the point at which it repeats. It repeats at that point, and then repeats after that point, and so on and so forth. So in other words, for A, repeats once in every two seconds. As you can see, this is two seconds. So frequency is one cycle in two seconds, which is one over half, obviously, has. Let's look at C or at B. B starts here and repeats after this point, after that point, after that point. In other words, each cycle takes four seconds, as you can see. One, two, three, four. Then we begin a new cycle. One, two, three, four, uh, which starts here and so on. So for B, frequency is one, re one cycle out of four seconds, which is a quarter hours. And so we can continue with this. If we look at C, we can see that from here, if we consider that to be the repeating point, up to that, before we repeat again, these are eight seconds. So that means for C, frequency is one over eight, has. And for D, if we look at this point, okay, let's look at that point up to that point. Because after that, it starts to repeat. These are 16 seconds, so we have one over 16. So that means, therefore, that if I had said that my F clock is 32 has, for instance, this is 32 has, that means that the F, the frequency of A is a half of the clock one. Okay, you can see we have already done this. It will be 16 has. For B, it will be, you know, uh, a quarter times 32, uh, which is eight. It will be eight has uh, for C, it will be one over eight times 32, which is four has. And for D, it will be one over 16 times 32. We, and so here we are getting two has. In other words, I start off with a clock frequency of 32 has, and my output at the output of the last flip flop is two has. We call this frequency division. And so if I want to get, if I have a clock that gives me 32 has, but I need a signal of two has, I can arrange my, 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 my flip flops in such a manner that outside on the outside on the output, I get a signal whose uh, frequency is lower, you know, in this case, uh, two has so that uh, that is an um, an application of ripple count of in fact all counters is frequency division we can use them to divide uh, the frequency we have to a frequency that we uh, would like to have. Right. Once again, if you have a question, uh, feel free to to ask. Another thing is you should make sure that when you come into the call, you mute yourselves. Uh, somebody like, um, okay, 
I think that those are the people who are making noise for us. Okay, I have a, a question here. Uh, please repeat the explanation of the multiplication. Uh, I don't quite understand uh, what you mean by that question. Um, but uh, I can... Now I have this recording. I'm happy to provide it later so that you can uh, look through. Okay. Hey, the point where I'm at. Okay, so you can see uh, clearly with your eyes that, uh, sorry, the, the clock is repeating itself faster. You know, it is the fastest at, you know, repeating itself. A follows, B follows, C follows, and D is quite slow. It is taking a much longer time. So my question was, how can we know the frequencies uh, of this. I started by showing that if I take the frequency of the clock to be one has, okay, then the frequency of A is clearly a half of that one has, right? Now the frequency of B is a half the frequency of A because remember this is the one uh, A is the one driving B. Just like we had the frequency of the clock at one and the frequency of A which it drives being a half. And so the frequency of B is a half frequency of A, which is a quarter. And the frequency of C is equal to a half the frequency of B, which is now one over eighth. And the frequency of D is a half the frequency of C, but now we know the frequency of C to be one over eight. So we have one over 16. Now it's because I started with a clock frequency of one has. Now what if the clock, these, these fractions actually sort of remain. So it is easy for me to say that F of B, okay, I know that F of A is a half F of the clock. So I can say F of B is a half, no, a quarter F of the clock. Um, F of C is one over eighth f of the clock and f of d is 1 over 16 f of the clock. So whatever clock frequency, whatever, uh, sorry, hmm. whatever clock frequency I have, whether it's 100, whether it's 256 has, I just use it in using these equations uh, are get. And now, if we had f of e, it would be one over 32 f of clock. If we had f of f, you know, another stage, the sixth stage, it would be one over 64 uh, f of the clock and so on and so forth. Uh, can they do frequency multiplication as well? No. They, in, this connect, in this connection counters, we always do uh, frequency division. The reason is uh, uh, that the so for instance, let us look at, uh, let's look at C, B, A. So we have 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1. So you can see that A is changing more rapidly than B. B is changing also twice as fast as C because two seconds, the next two seconds it changes. Whereas this one needs all four seconds to change. So you can see that as you move towards the most significant bit, uh, frequency just keeps reducing. You really never uh, get uh, a faster response, uh, so to speak. Now, if I wanted to multiply, or let's say, for instance, uh, just to, to, to continue with your discussion, uh, my frequency is, my clock frequency is 
no, no. I need, I have a clock frequency of, <coughs> I have a clock of um, maybe 64 hertz, but I need, I have, I need maybe frequency on the output, whatever that output is to be 128 hertz. You really can't move upwards unless now I go, I get a clock of say 256 and I divide it to get uh, what I want. Bor, you can Bor, you can ask your question. Bor, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Okay. Um, Bor, if you don't intend to ask a question, then please lower your hand or I'll probably just help you do that. <clears throat> okay. Some of this discussion we've already had. So we see that the mod number is two to power n where n is the number of flip-flops. Now look at this example. You have a counter that needs to count the number of items passing over a conveyor belt, like an industry. <clears throat> you have a photo cell and a light source combination that is used to generate a single pulse each time an item crosses its path. The counter must be able to count as many as 1,000 items, okay? So you have 1,000 unique items and we need to count them. How many flip-flops do we need? We need a flip-flop we need a counter of mod 1,000 or higher, right? Now, how do we get mod 1,000? We know that 2 to power 10 is 1, 0, 2, 4. 2 to power 9 is 5, I think, 1, 2. <clears throat> so, if we use nine flip-flops, we can only count 512 unique items. So, clearly, we take... 10, 10 flip-flops. We need 10 flip-flops uh, to count that. Now, these 10 flip-flops actually count up to 1024, but obviously, once we reach 1,000, we can stop there if we want. Later on, we'll see that we can also create a flip-flop that has a mod 1,000. Here, we can see that uh, when we have 10 flip-flops, we actually have a mod 1024 counter, but we are also able to actually design something that stops at just 1,000. Uh, strictly. Now, I could use more, I could use 11, 12, 15, whatever number of flip flops, and would still be able to count to make this counting. But the thing is that every extra flip flop is a waste. You don't really don't need it. Anything from 11 and above, you really don't need it. They are going to consume power, they are going to make your circuits bigger uh, for no reason uh, because 10 uh, are just enough. Okay, I'm going to give a short break in 10 minutes. You know, uh, when you are studying online, you need a break. Uh, and uh, I don't remember in the past in classroom, I don't give a break, but I'll give a short break and then we continue, but just in a, in a few minutes time. Okay. <clears throat> so, we have another question here, which says that we start at 0000, and then we apply some clock pulses, and some time later, we have reached 0011. So that's 0000, 0001, 0010, 0011, right? So from this point to this point, that is one pulse. From that point to that point, that's a second pulse. And from that point to that point, that's a third pulse. So they are asking the question, how many clock pulses have occurred? From here, it looks obvious that it's just, uh, innocent Mubanjizi, you need to keep muting yourself, please. Uh, from here, it looks obvious that, you know, there are three pulses, but the problem is that if you continue applying pulses, you will eventually reach one, 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 and when that, okay, so it will be one, 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 zero, and this will be the 16th pulse. 
because this is a mode 16 counter. Now, when you apply the 17th pulse, this takes you back to that, and then 18, 19, Okay, so that one will take the 16th pulse takes you to that, the 17th pulse takes you to that, the 18th pulse takes you to that, the 19th pulse will take you to that. In other words, it could be three, it could be 19, it could be 35, it could be, uh, I think, uh, uh, 51. Yes, uh, because that is 16. Uh, 32, 48, 64, it could be, I think, 67, and so on and so forth. So you can just keep adding 16, it will take you to the same, same state. Plus 16 will take you to the same state always. And so this question is not very easy to answer. You cannot just assume that we only applied three. We could have applied six, uh, 19 and would be in the same state. All right, we need to remember that every time the counter reaches its maximum state, which in this case is one, 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 which by the way, we call the terminal state, it goes back to the starting uh, position. <coughs> you can use log, I don't know, uh, I mean, if, if for instance I have, if I know that two to power n, because we know that the mod number <clears throat> is two to power n, this is mod number. So if I have uh, 1000, for instance, is equal to two to power n, or I should say that at least 1000 should be greater or equal to two to power n, I can say log 10 of 1000 is log 10 of two to power n, which means that n will be log 10 of 1000, which by the way, I think this is three over log 10 of two. Oh, I need to remember that uh, uh, now, now I don't know. I think this now needs to be greater, okay? Remember the inequality, this ne n needs to be greater. Lo three over log two should give you something like nine point, but we cannot have fractions of uh, of, of, of number of flip-flops. The, the flip-flop has to be a full number. So that should give, if, if it is n greater than nine point something, then clearly n should be 10, 11, 12, and so on. But we usually take the minimum because it can do the job uh, just as well. Uh, okay. We have talked about frequency division. Now, because these divide frequencies, we can call them, these RIPO counters, we can call them, or counters in general, we can call them divide by the mod number counter. So for instance, we had something like, uh, we said that the F frequency of D is one over 16 frequency of the clock, okay? And yet we know that this is a mod 16 counter. So we can also say this is a divide by 16 counter, just as simple as that. Because it divides the input frequency, which is the clock frequency by the mode number uh, to, to get the frequency at the output. Now, another thing you need to remember is that actually if we connect a display here, we connect a display here, we connect a pin there, a pin there, a pin there, and obviously this is the output, a pin there, then the states of these counters will be displayed here as D, C, B, A. Okay, great. Now let's just look at propagation delay in RIPO counters. Now you see the problem with RIPO counters, the, the, the way they are connected is that uh, the signal applied here and the clock, usually they take some finite time. Even when you're moving from a one to zero, it is not straight. It is usually, there's some delay, you know? Uh, this is something that we call a propagation delay or a transition delay, which is T, PD. So in other words, there is a, sig there is a time that the signal moves from, uh, sorry, 
from the input through the, the, the flip-flop to do its thing until that effect is reflected at the output. That is called a TPD and it happens in each flip-flop. Now the problem with the RIPO counter is that actually, um, the, for example, this flip-flop cannot do anything until that one has finished because its input is the one that affects that one. So we realize that this one has, B has to wait for A, equally C has to wait for B, and then D also has to wait for C. In other words, D has to wait for C and D and B and A. That means that the total delay at the output here, uh, which I can call total, is the delay in C plus the delay in B uh, plus the delay in A, T, P, D, A, and in fact, plus the delay in T, P, in D itself, okay? Because if I'm looking here, I've suffered this delay, that delay, that delay, and that delay. So we can therefore say, I don't know why, yes, I can therefore say that the total delay in a RIPO counter is equal to the number of flip-flops that they delay per flip-flop. Okay, TPD is the delay per flip-flop because I know that they are actually aggregating, they are adding up uh, over and over. Let us look at an example like this. You have your clock signal maybe changing, but there is a small delay that A suffers, okay? So maybe that clock pulse takes a thousand nanoseconds and you have a 50 nanosecond uh, delay. But now if I'm considering B, B will suffer its own delay and the delay of A, right? So for it, it will suffer 150 nanose 100 nanoseconds. And now C will suffer the delay of its own flip-flop, C, plus the delay at B and the delay at A, which is um, um, 150 nanoseconds. Now we are lucky here that this is very large, a thousand nanoseconds. But for instance, if, uh, sorry, the pulse, the pulse width was say 100 nanoseconds and you are losing 50 nanoseconds, another 50 here. Uh, by the time you start losing 150 nanoseconds, you are suffering a delay. Uh, you are suffering a delay that is greater than the pulse width. That means that actually what happens is you start to jump some some stages. So you may uh, move from, when, when you are sampling, you might say 0, 0, 0. 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. And instead of 0, 1, 1, now you cannot get that state, so you go to 1, 0, 0. Then you jump a state and that is a problem. Therefore, we want to make sure that the pulse width is always greater or at worst equal to the total delay, right? The pulse width should be greater or equal to the total uh, delay. Because if it is greater, then we are going to have uh, a big, big problem. Now, let me give you an example. Uh, let me give you uh, an example where we say that um, so for instance, pulse width is equal to 100 nanoseconds and the delay is 50 nanoseconds. Now, uh, we can say that because we want pulse width, this is delay per flip-flop. Because we want pulse width to always be greater or equal to total delay, that means that our 100 nanoseconds should always be greater than N times TPD per flip-flop, which is 50 nanoseconds, uh, 50 nanoseconds, 50 nanoseconds, All right? This is two, meaning that two should always be greater than N, or so to speak, N should always be less than or equal to two. So if I have a scenario like this, where my pulse width of the clock is 100 nanoseconds, but the delay per flip-flop is 50, I can only reconstruct a mode for counter, a counter that has only two flip-flops. A 
a counter that has only two flip flops uh, because uh, I'm trying to unmute some people here. They are really uh, disturbing. Okay, guys, when you come in, try to unmute yourselves. Okay, right. Okay, so let us look at some slides. Okay, so you can see that to ensure normal communication on, sorry, normal operation, the delay, the total delay, no, no, the, the, the period of the clock, the pulse width of the clock should always be greater than N times TPD uh, if you don't want to jump some states. So now we have a four bit counter constructed using JK flip flops, whose TP, okay, that is the propagation delay from the low to the high, uh, is 16 nanoseconds and propagation from high to low is a little longer. Okay, so this can happen where the transition in either direction uh, takes a very different um, delay. What is the maximum frequency? So we can say that the T clock should be greater or equal to N, which is four times the propagation delay. The propagation delay here, we take the worst case scenario. In this case, it is 24 nanoseconds. That is the delay it takes when the input comes in for the flip-flop to respond. And so we should take the worst case scenario uh, because somebody might want to use an, an NGT or a PGT positive going transition. Uh, and so we should make sure that whichever choice they make, uh, they are still able to operate normally. And so we take the worst case scenario, which is uh, 24 uh, nanoseconds. And so we know that frequency is equal to one over period. And so I can say that uh, if I say now one over T, now the thing changes. Yeah? It becomes less or equal to, I think anyway, but even if it doesn't, it's okay. Uh, but I think it changes. That is 96 nanoseconds. And we are, and, and obviously this is clock. So we can have a value of F less or equal to uh, I don't know uh, the I think it is less or equal to ten point four two. I think that is a megahertz, right? That's ten point four two megahertz. So if my frequency is less or equal, then it means that my frequency maximum is the is actually the maximum, which is 10.42 uh, megahertz. Uh, what is a six bit counter use? What of a six bit counter using the same flip flops? If it was a six bit counter, then my F would be less or equal to one over six times uh, 24, uh, nanoseconds, which is equal to is it six point nine megahertz? I think. All right, meaning that now my F max is equal to, okay, 6.9 megahertz. Now we see here that when we have fewer flip flops, we can work at a higher frequency. Uh, however, when we increase flip flops, we can only work at a lower frequency. That is only specific to ripple counters. Now, the, the reason here obviously is that the more the flip-flops, the higher the delay, the total, the, the total delay. You know, if you add the flip-flop, you just add an exact amount of delay. Uh, you add another one, you add another amount of delay. And so when you're adding so many, if you increase the number, you have more delay, meaning that you need to reduce the frequency. Otherwise, you're going to jump some uh, steps within your counting. So, so then 
we can state that there is a trade-off. I don't know if you know the meaning of the word trade-off, but I think you should. Uh, there is a new entrant, Tomorami Ronald, please. Uh, there is a, a there is a trade off. A trade off is something you know. I give you something, you give me something. That's a trade off. So here we see that there is a trade off between the size of the counter, okay, or the range of the counter, how many flip flops it has, and the frequency at which it works. So if you want a high range counter, a long range counter, sorry, then you're going to have to work at a lower frequency than somebody who has a short range counter. Okay. Uh, if you have any questions, put them in the chat. Uh, otherwise, let us take a, about, um, uh, we are going to continue uh, studying up to midday, by the way, for today, this week, uh, because Peterson is, is probably going to teach uh, another time. And so let's take about eight minutes. We'll return at 11.15. And please do keep time. I'll see you in a moment.
Yes, yes. Okay, welcome back. Um, uh, hopefully you've had a break. Now, 
we are going to continue our discussion. I'm hoping that I can finish counters in two in two lectures because I'm just not quite sure, but it's possible that you've already we did this in first year actually. So we do have what we call synchronous counters. Synchronous counters, you see, we've seen that the problem with um, uh, RIPO counters is that you have that delay that keeps adding up. That delay that keeps adding up is what is causing problems for um, uh, for the RIPO counters. So you have delays that keep adding up. The reason why that is, is because we are not clocking the flip-flops simultaneously. We are not clocking them all at the same time. Now, synchronous counters try to change that. Obviously, they are called synchronous because flip-flops are, uh, all the flip-flops within those counter, within the counter, are clocked simultaneously. You know, you know, it's done, all of them work in synchronism uh, with the clock pulse. So we can see that we still have our four bit counter. Okay, this is a four bit counter, but there are some differences. First of all, you can first of all ignore the clear, uh, but even if you don't ignore it, that's okay. Uh, however, you can see that now the clock pulse is being fed into all of the flip-flops. So all flip-flops have clock input from the same source, from the same source, from the clock source, you know. Before we would have the output of A going into the input, or the clock input of B, and so on and so forth. The other thing, and a, perhaps a critical one, is that J and K should be equal to one for, for flip-flop A. For flip-flop A, J is equal to K is equal to one, but that is where it ends. The, all of the flip-flops don't have J equals K is equal to one as we saw in the previous case. In this case, only J uh, has a flip-flop. And now here, we can see that the output of A is being fed into both J and K. Now, when we come to C, we see that A, is combined with B through an AND gate, and that output is fed into both J and K. And when we come to D, we see that now A, B, and C are combined through an AND gate, and that input is being fed, uh, that output is being fed into both of J and K. That means that if we had another free flop like E, we have J here and K. What would feed in here is an AND output that includes A, B, C, and D. So it just keeps developing like that. So some of the disadvantages obviously of the uh, synchronous counters is that they have more circuitry because we need now AND gates. We have more circuitry, we have more transmission lines and so on. But the good thing with it is that because we are clocking at the same time, the total delay is equal to delay of flip-flop, you know, of one flip-flop plus delay of one AND gate. So it doesn't add up. Even if we have a thousand flip-flops, still the delay would be the same, just just the same, just for one of them. Because remember, they are clocked at the same time, so they all go through the same amount of delay and also are, are, are able to operate uh, at the same time. So I could say that two TPD is equal to flip flop TPD plus and get uh, TPD. Right. So now, how does this thing operate? Let me just create a new, I'm sure you do know how to this operate because it's just digital anyway. Okay, let that go. Now, let us start by assuming that uh, DCBA is equal to zero, 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 zero. Now, remember A is one. J and K are always one. So we expect that every time the clock pulse comes in, we are going to toggle. And you can see that we toggle 
every time. All right. Okay, so in the first case, we have zero, zero, zero. Now when the clock, the first clock comes in, the clock one, A will toggle. Okay, A will toggle, but uh, uh, A will come to one, but previously there was a zero here. So the zero will go to J and K, obviously. Because before it was a zero, now when A becomes one, the zero which was here moves into that direction to J and K. J and K me being zero means that B will remain zero. Remember the uh, J, K flip-flop. Um, when we have a zero, zero input, then our output does not change. Now, when we apply the second pulse, A will toggle again, you know? <clears throat> A was a one, so it will go back to zero, okay? Which is in this case. But now, because it was a one, this one is pushed into this because the clock has found the one here. So now B is going to toggle as well because J is one and one. So that's why we have a one. Now we can continue with this. Uh, let's just continue focusing on B and A. In the next moment when another clock comes, the zero which is here now goes there because now we have, of course, this is going to toggle to a one, all right, here. But there was a zero previously here, which actually now acts on flip flop B. Uh, and because it is a zero, there is going to be no change, and B will remain a one. Now, because now remember we have a one, a one at A. Now, when we toggle again, A becomes zero, but this one is the one that acts on B, and because it is a one one, B will toggle back to zero. And actually that continues to be the same process if you consider both D and C. It, it, you just continue looking at the outputs and you'll be able to work out uh, how the rest of this works, basically. But that is how it works. You have to look at the previous state and see how it affects the next state when the clock pulse comes in. But this technically is called uh, uh, is called a parallel counter. I don't know where some know of you from. are. Uh, good fregatonia. Uh, huh? It looks like some people are in the in the street. Eh? Um. Now, when you are on the street, you don't have to attend eh? because you can see I'm not taking attendance. You can read, you can see the video later, you know. It's okay. Eh? We no longer, uh, we, 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 we no longer stress about these things. Okay. Now, we have, let's consider a scenario where the AND gate is say 10 nanoseconds. And the flip-flop TPD is equal to 20, let me say, let me say 15 nanoseconds. I've seen, um, oh, on the third clock pulse. Okay, I'm just going to take a, a moment and, and explain that again. Uh, but let me finish this one, which I had started. Now, because this is the total delay, remember the T clock should be, or we can say F should be less or equal uh, to one over uh, total delay, so to speak. So now flip flop, the, sorry, the frequency is now less or equal to one over 25 nanoseconds, which is obviously 400. Is it 40? I think it may be 40. Uh, yes, it is 40 megahertz, right. Now, this is per. Now, what if it was um, RIPO? 
Now we know that the repo does not have um, that does not have an AND gate. So for it, F would be, or uh, obviously now, F max here is 40 megahertz. If it was a RIPO counter, F would be less or equal to one over NTPD, and we see TPD is 15, so 60 nanoseconds, which is, I don't even know, 60, which is 16.7 megahertz. So F max for a RIPO counter using this would actually be 16.7 megahertz. So you can see that when we use, uh, when, when, when we use a, a parallel counter, we can work at higher frequencies, but the trade-off is a little bit more complexity, some more gates like AND gates and so on. Uh, with the RIPO counter, we can only support lower frequencies because remember the delay adds up or aggregates. Okay, uh, so somebody wanted some bit more explanation. Why do you consider the delay of one AND gate yet there are two gates in the circuit? This is the same, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I'm happy to answer that. Uh, this is the same as why do I consider the flip-flop, just one flip-flop instead of four? Because the clock comes in at the same time, at the same time, these flip-flops start their response at the same time. But equally, the gates also start their response at the same time, okay? So, so the two, the two AND gates are working in unison because when this one finishes, it is the same point at which that flip-flop also finishes. And so the, the signal going into the AND gates is available at the same time. That's why I, you, you, they, they are delay seems to be like the delay of one AND gate because they suffer the delay, but they both suffer it at the same time. It doesn't add up. It is the same, same scenario as this one. Another question that somebody could ask is why do you add them? The reason why we add them is that you can see they are the output, they are at the output of the flip-flop. In other words, they first wait for this flip-flop to operate and then they are able to operate when the signal reaches here. That means that when the flip-flops are working, the, the AND gates have nothing to do. They have to wait until they are done and then they can start. So that's why we add up the, 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 the two delays uh, in a, in linear in scale, scale like like in in linear so to speak. Okay, let me explain again what is happening between B and C. And I'm going to create another duplicate of this. Um, and now I can delete this. Okay, so let us start again. So we know that each of these is zero, right? Uh, this is uh, state zero, obviously state zero. Now, when we get our first clock pulse, this state will toggle, okay? So A will become one. But this is, when it becomes one, this zero was already existing here, so it will act on B. But because it is zero, B will remain uh, uh, zero, because remember, when you have zero, zero, nothing changes. On the second pulse, uh, A will toggle again to one, but now this one was already acting on B, and because it is one, one, B will, will become one. Now, on the next pulse, uh, A will toggle, sorry, so, so that becomes one, but there was already zero here you know, at A, before it toggles to one, there was A available here, meaning that when the clock pulse comes, it actually finds a zero. And so that is the one that acts on that. And because it is a zero, that will remain a one. In the next part, A will toggle to a zero. But that one was already at the output here, meaning that now B needs to toggle. In the next moment, A toggles to one. But what was at the, out, at the output of A, meaning input of B, it is a zero, meaning that B will also still remain a zero, and so on and so forth. So hopefully now uh, it is clear. Okay. 
so determine f max for the previous counter if tp is, is 15 nanoseconds and that's 20. Compare this with the mod 16 counter. So we have already done both of these. <clears throat> what must be done to convert this counter to a mod 32? Mod 32, it's already mod 16, so we add another flip flop, you know, the fifth one. Uh, f max for the mod 32 parallel counter, we've already seen this one actually. So when you get uh, an answer, say f max, no, for instance, let us look at this example. We had seen that f max is 40 megahertz, and this was a four bit, right? Now, if we add, Polina uh, Gava, I think is in town. Innocent Mubanj is here. I don't know why he never gets our, uh, our messages to, to mute himself. And also Atamba Moses. Right. So this is a four bit counter. And we have seen that it will stop at 40. It will have an F max. So what if we add another, add another flip flop? The thing is that even if you add another flip flop, you will still have the same delay. Even if you add a thousand flip flops, you will still have the same delay from TPD of the flip flop and TPD of the AND gates. And so it does not change uh, the maximum uh, frequency. We saw that with the RIPO counter, when you add flip flops, you reduce the maximum frequency at which you can operate. This is not the case in parallel counters. And so this is really a big advantage. You do not have to trade off the counting range with the, with the number of flip-flops. <clears throat> oh, sorry, with the frequency, maximum frequency. Now, sometimes we need mod numbers that are not within the cycle of two to power n. Because you see two to power n is two, four, Eight, sixteen, thirty-two, sixty-four, one twenty-eight, five, uh, two five six, five one two, one zero two four, and so on. That is the sequence of two to power n as n increases. However, if I want to count a thousand things or a hundred things, how can I create that counter? Let's start off with a simpler one. The, the, the flip, the, the, the delay, uh, Ian, uh, uh, thanks for the question. The reason why the delay does not change is because if I add, if I add a flip flop here, it will be driven by the same, by the same clock. Even if I add another one, it will be the, still the same clock. And so when the clock changes, it changes all of these at the same time, whether it's they are two or 10 or 100, all of them are clocked at the same time. And so their delay is the same. All of them take the same delay. And at the end, at the end of the day, it looks like all of them are able to operate after the same amount of delay, whether they are five or 10 or 20 or 30. This continues also for the AND gate. That's why as you add flip-flops, the delay suffered does not change because all of them are in synchronism. They start operating at the same time and they end at the same time if we assume that they have the same uh, delay or the same type, okay? And once they are done, the AND gates now start operating as well. And then you have that addition. Whether they are a thousand AND gates, all of them start operating at the same time and suffer the same delay, okay? Right. So let us start with this simple one. This is a three bit. We can see it's a three bit, um, three bit ripe, uh, not ripe, power counter. And so we can say C, B, A. Zero, 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 one, zero, one, zero, zero, one, 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 zero, zero, one, zero, one, 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 zero, one, one, one. Okay, so that's where we stop. Now let's assume that we are counting because we've already seen how this counts. So we are counting, but now we have a clear input, clear. 
clear input and that input uses an, it is being driven by a NAND gate. Some of you don't remember NAND gates, but we are, we are all going to get there, don't worry. <clears throat> and we can see that we have an NAND gate whose inputs are B and C. So basically these inputs, you could connect them to that point and that point. They just didn't connect them because you don't want too many lines, but it is very uh, obvious. And so how does an NAND gate operate? If we have B and C and output, and we are doing an AND gate 0, 0, 0, 0001, 1, 0, 1, 1. So this is a zero, the rest are ones. That's how an AND gate operates. Now, if we look at this clear input, it is very easy to see that this is active law. Hmm? Uh, active law, active law means that if I want to clear this, I'm going to make my output law. If I'm sorry, the input. If I if I make sure that the input here is low, that means the zero is going into these, and you can see they have bubbles. Then I'm going to clear these flip flops. What does it mean to clear flip flops? It means that whatever state the flip flop is in, it goes to zero. Okay, that means uh, clearing the flip flop. Stipe Brian, please unmute yourself. Always Liso as well. And okay, and so we need to keep an eye out. Now we have seen from this, we have seen from this table that we will clear when B is equal to C is equal to one, because that's when uh, that's when our output becomes zero. So when we have a one and a one here, this becomes zero, and that goes and clears this. Now, another thing we need to remember is that the clear input is asynchronous. In other words, it does not wait for the clock pulse for it to act. Once you give it, once the, 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 the clear input is active, immediately it will clear the flip-flops, okay? So with those facts, now we can continue. Now we see that we are looking for a scenario. That means we are going to have this state. You can say zero, you know, count or we can say clock, you know, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. Now at this point, B and C are one. And the moment they become, because C was already one, but B was a zero. The moment B changes to a one, immediately at that point, we clear the flip-flops back to zero obviously when you clear flip flops they all go back to zero 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 you can see that all of them are being cleared by the same parts and so we call this a temporary state this state up happens or exists for a few nanoseconds the moment b becomes a, a one then the nand gate gives an output of zero or you know taking in the de few delays of the nand gate then you clear you clear that then we continue counting again until we reach this point and we clear again. And so we can say that actually we are only able to count through one, two, three, four, five, six states. We never do the seventh and the eighth state. We only do zero, zero, zero to one, zero, one. One, one, zero is a very temporary state that we don't count. And so we can confidently call this a mod six counter because it counts up to decimal five or so to speak, it counts through six unique uh, uh, states that makes it a mod six counter. Now we were used to a mod eight counter before, but now we can see that we can create a mod six counter. And when we go to create bigger counters that do not fall within uh, these powers of two, then we do exactly the same thing as I have done, only that this time we might need more flip flops, obviously. Now, this is what I've actually just done. The moment we reach this state, we clear. And so we really don't count it. It is a very temporary state. We are only interested in these one, two, three, four, five, six. Now we can see, for instance, that A is going to change normally. Okay. We know that this is the fifth pulse. Okay. So this is the, the point where we want to cheat look. That is the fifth pulse. At the fifth pulse, we are going to have this is going to be one zero one right 
Now at the sixth pulse, we would at the seventh pulse, we would be getting one, one, zero, right? Meaning that A would become a, a zero, B would become, remember it was a zero, it would become a one, and C obviously would stay at one. The problem is that the moment B goes to one, it immediately clears. And so even C, which was one, would clear back to zero. And you can see that the NAND gate is always at a high, but momentarily it goes to a zero, meaning that the moment it goes to a zero, these things clear, and when they clear going back to zero, 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 if you look back here on this diagram, the moment B, C, and A go back to zero, then we also get our NAND output going back to one. These are called glitches, okay? Like a glitch, it's a glitch in B, in the signal of B. They are, they are very small, they are just little spikes. But you guys, when you are in class, don't be talking to, to other people. I think that's with Dali Henry. At least I can see you here much as I don't know, I don't remember most of your faces. Uh, but if you come to a lecture, even if it's online, shut out everything and concentrate. And so these are called glitches. They, they, they are not a very major problem in electronics, but they happen because of the delays. You know, The moment this goes up and we clear, it takes a um, little time uh, for it to, to come back uh, to the zero state. Now, once again, we can create a state transition diagram which shows how we are transitioning from state to state. So obviously we are moving from zero, zero all the way through one, zero, one. Now this shows that we go through a state that is very temporary, but in reality, okay, in reality we go through here, but we usually ignore that and we know that these are the real permanent states. Okay, from this state we go to that, although we know that we pass through that one temporarily. This is a state that obviously this uh, mod six counter never reaches. It never uh, counts that state. So what is the mode of this counter? I'll give you three minutes. What is the mode number of this counter? This is a four bit counter. Okay, it has four bits because it has four flip flops. But because we have our NAND gate here, we and that NAND gate is clearing these flip flops. The moment it becomes, it has a low state. Uh, it has a low state. It will clear these flip flops. That means that this thing never counts all the way to one, 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 one. So what is the mod number? Um, I'll give you a few minutes. Two minutes. Okay, I'm seeing mode 14. I believe that that's correct. Yes, I'm seeing mode 14. So basically you see here that we have, we know that D, C, these things are actually quite easy to do. We have, <coughs> uh, we are going to clear the moment B, sorry, the moment D, C, B, R, R1, okay? So we can say zero. What is the state before this one? Maybe the state before this one is one, one, zero, one, I think. And so we are at this state, one, one, zero, one. No. Yes, I think I'm correct. And then we would usually go to one, 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 one. So the moment we reach this stage, you can see that now both DC, DC and B become a one. And when they are one, the, the NAND gate output will become a zero and that will clear these ones uh, back to uh, zero, 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 zero. So that means that this is a temporary state. We don't count it. And obviously this never happens. 
So since originally we would have had a mode 16 counter, that means we are taking out two states. We are taking out that state and that state, meaning we create a mode 14 counter. Or if you counted from 0, 0, 0, you did your truth table to this state, this one here, which is 1, 1, 0, 1, you would find that these are 14 distinct states, thus creating a mode 16 counter. And what is the mode number of this one? Very good. Uh, some of you who are saying uh, uh, mod 10, uh, you are correct. Uh, this is a mod 10 counter because you can see that we have B and D. And so if we have D, C, B, A, and we are saying that D and B, so this is a one, I don't know, that's one zero because C needs to be zero before it becomes one and one and maybe zero. One zero one zero it would become one zero one one, but before this it would be one zero zero one. So the moment that and obviously one zero zero one is decimal nine. And so if we start from zero 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 to one zero zero one, these are and the next one is one zero one zero. The moment D and B become a one, both of them simultaneously, then we are going to clear the flip-flops uh, at this point back to that point. And if you can't, you'll find that these are 10 uh, steps and we are creating a mod 10 counter. Now, a mod 10 counter is also called, in this case, this mod 10 counter is called a BCD counter. The reason it's called a binary coded decimal counter. So these values are, you know, this is zero decimal, that is nine decimal and so on and so forth. So we are using binary counting uh, 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 and that stops at 10. So that's why we call it a BCD counter. But generally a mod 10 counter is also called uh, a decade counter. Decade is 10, decade counter. But not all decade counters are BCD counters. Certainly all BCD counters are decade counters because they stop at, they count 10. But decade counters might not count in binary. If they count in binary, then they are called binary coded decimal, BCD counters. But if they don't count in binary, then they are decade counters that do not count in binary. They are just decade counters. Okay. <clears throat> uh, very good. So if uh, uh, we have seen that it is mod 10, uh, which is uh, fine. Uh, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So let me uh, let me give you a question here. If my clock pulse frequency is thirty kilohertz, what is the output frequency of this decade counter? And when I say output frequency, I mean f out of d frequency of d.
Uh -huh. Do we have an answer? Okay, Mary Akello is right. Uh, yes. Um, all of you are right, three kilohertz. Patience, lucky. Yeah, three kilohertz, because we know, uh, we know generally that output frequency is the same as input frequency over mod number, as simple as that. And so even before when we had mod 16 counters, we were taking the F clock over 16 to get the, at the output FD. So in this case, it's 30 over 10, which is uh, three kilohertz. All right. Uh, thank you very much. We've come to the end of our lecture, a whole two hours, I feel exhausted. Uh, I'm going to, 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 I've been recording and so I'm going to have a video. Um, I don't know how, or uh, maybe I'll share it on my Google Drive and uh, then you can download it uh, off of that. <coughs> yeah, I think I can do that. You, I, I'll share the link and everyone is able to, to download the copy. Um, uh, but otherwise, uh, we'll, we'll meet again on Monday, God willing. Uh, we can continue to use this link. Uh, we can continue to use this link. Uh, but yes, I'm going to share, <clears throat> I'm going to share the, the video. Now, I will not share these slides, of course, because you have the book, so you don't really need the slides. Yes, Ian, I was saying that generally, this was before. We don't even remember, maybe you are not here. Let me just briefly take you since it's not yet midday. Um, okay, so it was here, you see, it was here. This is a mod 16 counter. And we saw that FD is one over 16 of the input clock FC. So in fact, what it is is that uh, F in, no, F out, at the actual output there, you know, the, the final one is the same as F, F in, which is F clock really, over mod number. It's just a formula. Um, you guys, eh? you guys are interesting. What time are we meeting on Monday? I thought our lecture is on Monday. Hmm? Somebody asked me privately what time we meet on Monday. We'll meet in the lecture time. Uh, I wish you share the slides too. It makes no, no, no. These share these slides are mine. I sh I, I just made them in the morning. It, they are not good, so <laughs> so I will not give them to you. But the video, you know, all this stuff I've been writing is in the video if you want. Uh, okay. No, no, I can't share them. I mean, if you wanted to prepare slides that I can share, they would be much nicer than this. This was just for me to aid me to teach. As I've said at the beginning, I don't usually do slides, but now that we are doing online, if I didn't do slides, these lectures wouldn't go very well at all. But you can create your own slides, you know, it's okay. Thank you very much. See you next week. Have a nice weekend.